Turn on captions. I think I've started everything. I hope I have. All right. So here we go. Chapter five. The reason we're going to chapter five is I didn't get any questions. I started the homework yesterday and I saw our five or six of y'all started the homework. So I gave y'all to Wednesday, so we're going to go ahead and start with chapter five. And there is chapter five. We actually start with probability. OK. And what is probability? Anybody ever got everybody? I went, that was rhetorical, but I appreciate your interaction. Everybody ever got on Wild Hog Road before? Oh, I'm sorry. Highway 187 North. <laughs> Wild Hog Road. It goes from Highway 187, Highway 24, Pendleton. Yeah. Highway 187 North, for some of you that don't know. It's called Wild Hog Road. <laughs> anyway, let's say it takes 15 minutes to travel to Wild Hog Road. Okay, and for some of y'all, there's always a guy in the group that can travel the speed of sound. I could travel it in five minutes. You're an idiot. All right. Most most people travel it in 15 minutes. Got girls? That's another indicator. If you're ever in a group and you, you say you go on vacation and you go to Panama City and how long did it take you to get down there? Oh, about eight hours. There's always a guy in the group that can travel the speed of light. Make sure you stay away from that guy. That's future domestic violence, okay? Because he's an idiot. All right, now, to get back to the story, if you can travel Wild Hog Road in 15 minutes and shoot, you know, I'm talking about when you get to Garrett's, the red light at Garrett's, to the red light right below the Waffle House, okay? That's 15 minutes. It usually takes 15 minutes at about four o'clock in the morning, okay? If you get on that road in 15 at 15 minutes till eight and you got an eight o'clock class, you're gonna be very late for your class. Why? Because the blue haired ladies club gets out after eight o'clock. And those are the ones that get in front of you and do what? Go 35 miles an hour. And even those idiots that think they're, you know, driving the speed limit, y'all, why are y'all on your computer? I'm not doing anything. Listen. You know, I know teenagers don't listen, but you know, it might behoove you to listen to this. All right. And you get up to the red light in Pendleton and you say to yourself, this lady's going to turn left. And what happens as soon as you say that? She turns right. So she turns on her left turn signal. She, she filled up her, her blinker fluid. Okay. <laughs> Did you just tell the future? Yes or no? No, you did not. Nobody can tell the future. Nobody. Maybe, maybe, or, or what's his name, McFly, that went and got the uh, got the sports on that, you know, came back. Marty McFly, he might can tell the future with the sports on that in his hand, but nobody can tell the future. I used to know somebody that told me that they could tell the future by dreams. I said, you're an idiot. And I'm no longer friends with that person. But have you ever had somebody tell you they can tell the future? All you got to do is ask them one question. Anybody know what that question is? What's lottery numbers for Friday night? Oh, that's not what I do. No, you can't tell the future. You're full of crap. OK? Nobody can tell the future. I don't care if you've got an aunt that says they can tell the future. You ever played 20 questions? Anybody ever played 20 questions? Then you can read people's minds. You cannot do that. It's called law of what? Deduction. All right. I travel. I traveled Wild Hog Road for 20 years of my career. OK, up and down Wild Hog Road. There's three ways to get to Sandy Springs, four ways to get to Sandy Springs. If you live on the west side of Anderson, which some of y'all do, there's no way to get to Pendleton unless you go Wild Hog Road, unless you go Clinton Boulevard, right? 
Yes or no? And people say, oh, well, you could go Centerville Road. I'm told that's Wild Hog Road, okay? You're going to get on Wild Hog Road when you get in Centerville Road, okay? So there's only two ways to get to Pendleton. So if somebody's on Pendleton, and using logic, if somebody's on Wild Hog Road, they're going to Pendleton if they're at Pendleton High School. Why? Because you got three rights you could have taken to go to Sandy Springs. So naturally, by logic, the person is going to turn left because if they was going to Sandy Springs, they would have turned right several places before. That's logic. What am I trying to tell you? If somebody tells you that they can tell the future, they're using 20, they're using 20 questions or logic or experience or mathematics to tell the future. And it's not telling the future, it's putting a number and write this down. This is probability. Putting a number or assigning a number. And this is a test question. Assigning a number between zero and one. To a prediction based on logic. Experience or mathematics. Assigning a number. Between zero and one. To a prediction based on logic, experience, or mathematics. So I challenge each one of you, if anybody ever walks up to you and tells you that they can tell the future, all you gotta do is ask them one question. What are the lottery numbers for Friday night's Mega Million? And what are the lottery numbers for Friday night's, let's see, Saturday night's Powerball? Oh, well, that's not what I do. You have a work email. What's telling the future? What's going to happen? So you tell the future, you give me the lottery numbers. If you can't do that, then you're full of crap. Because all you're doing, have you ever been to a fortune teller? What's the first thing they start doing? Well, first of all, they know you're depressed or they know you're in a depressed state because you're coming in and trying to get to your fortune. All right, so naturally, they know you're in a, in a state of doubt when you walk in the door. All right, 90% of the people that walk in to a fortune teller, 10%, hey, yeah, let's see what it's like. 90%, usually, they're in either a questionable state or a depressed state. So the person knows that with, with all the junk on them, and they're, they're, they already know that. So what do they start doing? Do they say hello and start telling your future, or do they start asking you questions? They start asking you questions. It's all 20 questions, deduction, or what? Or logic. Nobody can tell the future. Nobody. No person can tell the future. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you that. If they say they can, all you got to do is ask them one question. Give me the lottery numbers. Because if you think about it, you ever seen the movie 21? Anybody ever seen it? It's where the guy, the, the, the group of students from MIT go to go to uh, Las Vegas and count cards. What is that based on? They can't tell the future. It's based on mathematics, 100% mathematics. All right. That's that. That's what telling the future is to some people. 20 questions, the same thing. I can read your mind by telling you what you're thinking of, what animal you're thinking of, or what thing you're thinking of. I ask you 20 questions. Same thing. So. I want everybody to understand that a lot of people say, well, why are you spending 20 minutes on that one explanation? Because I want you to understand that I'm not telling you that I'm telling the future. What we are doing is assigning a number between zero and one to a prediction based on something. And that usually in this case is statistics. OK, so with that being said, let's move along. I try to use these slides from every now and then because I forget things. So I forget to go over things. And that's what law of large numbers. What is the law of large numbers? Law of large numbers is basically this. I told you about being a uh, executive with Michelin and pulling five tires from Sandy Springs, five tires from stars which is not star really that's not star over here but anyway they get the, they get the money but anyway 
the the whole point is if I only pull 10 tires and I say to the corporate executives up there in Spartanburg or between Greenville and Spartanburg, I say, well, we're going we're gonna to have about, tw about $2 million of defective tires next year. And then next year rolls around and it's 22 million. Guess what? Guess what I am? Fired. Okay. Fired. Terminated. Why? Because if Michelin is going to pay me six figures to do a job, what should I be doing? Your job. Not pulling five tires and five tires, but maybe pulling 500 and 5,000 tires. That's called the law of large numbers. In other words, don't half ass do your job. If you are in a quality assurance or a research type, and some of y'all will be, some of y'all are going to be going to college, going to a research university like Clemson or Georgia or wherever, and you're going to be in a master's thesis or a doctorate thesis, you're going to have to do the research and you're going to go through two classes. One's going to call research and the other one's going to call research too. And this is where you learn this stuff. And one of the things they teach you in those two classes is if you half ass do your research, people are going to know. People are going to know, especially when you put that little N is equal to, and instead of 1,000 people surveyed, you put 10, they're going to see it. And they're going to say, your stuff is trash. And that's how, you, that's how you know, when people go into a presentation and they laugh off the statistics, all they got to do is look at N is equal. If N is equal to a small number, your statistics is what? Worthless. Large number rule. Okay? Make sure you write that down. Wait for the large number. The more you survey, the more you research, the better, the more accurate your prediction will be. And you can write that any way you want to. I call it the half-ass rule. If you do things half-ass, you're going to present half ass. And for those of you who don't know, an ass is a donkey. Before somebody gets offended. So, if you want to predict how many tires are going to be defective for Michelin Corporation next year, you might want to pull more than five tires. Yeah. Next. And they'll probably give you another. And remember, random, that is a very important word in probability as well as statistics. I'm not going to go through simulation because most of y'all know what a simulation is. It's just a recreation, but I'm not going to test you on that. I'll test you on. I'll test you on what is probability and I'll test you on a uh, large number rule. I'll test you on that. Oh, me. I'm not going to go through that. I will go through probability if they ever get to it. There's there's their definition. The measure of likelihood of a random phenomenon or chance behavior occurring probability deals with experiments that yield random short results or outcomes yet reveal a prediction. I think mine makes a whole lot more sense, but that's just me. But you can write that down and memorize that. But basically, using logic, you lose using experience, using mathematics to make a prediction of an event between zero and one. They don't even tell you between zero and one. As the number of repetitions, write this down. And the reason I want you to write it down after I told you is because this is a, as long as well as probability, this is a standardized test question. Law of large numbers. What is the law of large numbers? And I want you to write it word for word. So in case you see it on a standardized test, along with the probability definition. As the number of repetitions of a probability experiment increases, the proportion which a certain outcome is observed gets closer to the probability of the outcome. There's two outcomes, there's two probabilities in mathematics. There is the 
theoretical probability. Somebody tell me what is the probability of picking a king out of a deck of cards? I didn't hear you. What? There's 52 in a deck of cards. Four out of 52. Does anybody have a deck of cards with them? Then that's theoretical. You see? Why do you, why is it called theoretical? Because you don't have a deck of cards in front of you. You're going off of what? You're going off of numbers that you know. That is called theoretical probability, and you're going to see this in just a minute. Now, what if I each give you a deck of cards? I used to do this, but some people couldn't handle it, so I quit doing it, guys. I used to give out a deck of cards, give out like five deck of cards, and we'll split y'all into groups and a die. And we used to do that, but some of the guys couldn't handle it, so we just quit doing it. See, one person ruins it for everybody. Anyway, what if I give you a deck of cards and you do 10 hands? Shuffle, pick, shuffle, pick, shuffle, pick. What is that? That's what you call physical probability. Now, will those two match? No. But if you do, let me just give you this. Let me give you this example. Two MIT students decided to take a roll of quarters. And you might want to write this down because it took a roll of quarters. And you just write down the specifics. They took a roll of quarters and they measured and weighed and checked the balance of each one of those quarters. How many quarters are in a roll of quarters? I don't even know. Is it $10? Yeah. 40, 40, 40 quarters? They measured each one of those 40 quarters. Now, the good thing is the mint usually puts out quarters that are usually identical, right? As far as weight and height and all that stuff. So they came out with a nice number. They measured all those divided by 40, and that was the average. They put that into a computer program and generated an algorithmic quarter, you know, virtual quarter. And they flipped that quarter until What's the probability of tails on a quarter? 0.5, right? 50%. They flipped that quarter until they got 50% probabilities. Anybody want to take a guess on how many flips it took? Four. Four. Anybody got another guess? Seven. Seven. Took 100,000 flips for that quarter to get to 0.49999995. That's a lot of large numbers, which says don't half ass do your research. OK, if you're going to present to people and I don't care if you're at Tri-County Tech presenting to a class or if you're at Michelin, you better not half ass your research because they will know. All they got to do is look at N as equal. If I am doing a research project for Michelin, and I show up to a corporate meeting and N is equal to 15, they're going to fire me right there on the spot. OK, so make sure you understand that question. Make sure you understand the law of large numbers. Now, somebody said percent a while ago, percent. Percent equals chance, write that down, percent equals chance. Am I asking you the chance or the probability? I'm asking you the probability. Probability is a decimal, but probability is equal to decimal. So I don't say 50%. Somebody said 50 a while ago, and that's good. That's okay. But not many people know this. Using percent in probability is like using ain't in an English class. Some teachers, Whatever. Some teachers will have a conniption if you do that. I'm not one of those teachers, OK? 0.5 is what you're supposed to say, a 0.5 probability or a 0.25 probability or a 0.78 probability. And then if you want to say a chance, then you say a 50% chance. Not many people understand that, but now you do. You might want to write that down for future classes. Because I can guarantee you, if you go into a class in Clemson, especially a research class, and you say 50% probability, some of those teachers that live, eat, and drink this subject, they'll just have a connection. 
like a, I don't know if English teachers still have a connection when you say the word ain't, but they will have a connection. All right. Next. And we already talked about experiment. Experiment is when you actually touch or do something in an observation. Sample space. What is a sample space? This is this is this is a test question. <clears throat> the best way to explain a sample space. A couple wants to have two children. What is the sample space for having two children? Boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. Those four equals a sample space. Write that down as an example so you'll understand what a sample space is. A sample space is the actual outcomes of an experiment or an observation, whichever one you want to call it, since you don't have anything really to do with the sex of a baby. All right, it's considered an observation. I wouldn't call the sex of a baby an experiment, although nowadays I should. Now, should you go to Google tonight and pull up sample space for children? Yes. Up to what? Up to four. And print it out. And I'll show you for the two people that's going to do it. And I'll pull it over here for the home people. And you might have to do some searching and the two people that's going to do this, they're going to probably do it anyway since they're doing it. Sample space for children. And do images. And I would highly suggest that you find two. You don't, we just did two. I mean, that's not hard. Three and four. And put it on an index card. Now, the two or three people that's going to do this, they're going to have it on the test. They're going to have it right there. The other people that are not going to do it, they're going to be scrounging on the test, and they'll probably get it wrong because, I'm sorry, people wonder why I teach from home. Oh, my oh. Lord. You'll have to excuse me because if I unhook this thing, you know what will happen. You'll see why I teach from home. Yeah, the people that are going to do it. There's four. And you can just type, there's three right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's supposed to be eight. There's eight. Should be eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, Make sure you print out two children, three children, and four children and put them <laughs> on a index card for your test for the two people that's going to do it. Okay. One, two. Let's see, what is that? 12, 13, 14, 15. That looks like 15, doesn't it? There should be one for four girls, shouldn't there? 
should be 16. I don't understand why they don't have one for girls. Make sure it should be 16. There we go. So you put that one. All you got to do is copy and paste, which I know some of y'all won't do, but anyway. All right, so that's that. That's the sample space. Why did I show you that? Because it's easier to show you an example of a sample space than it is to tell you. And that's why. So what would a sample space be for? And you can apply the, 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 the two children to coins. It's the same one because heads, tails, boy, girl. All right, you can apply the same thing. So if a question says heads or tails, you just use the boy, girl as an example. Unless you want to have two index cards, which gives you heads and tails. And, I mean, that's just it's ridiculous. Okay, you don't need to do that. And that is a test question, so make sure you uh, do that. An event is one of the outcomes. Write that down. An event is one of the outcomes. So if you have a boy and a girl, that is an event. Each event makes up the sample space. We're going through a little bit of chapter one and chapter two here. We ain't doing any math yet, but we will. OK, here's a die. One die is called a die. What is the probability? These are all theoretical because we don't have a die in front of us and that one don't roll. OK, so what is the probability of a six? One out of six. And then you would put that in your calculator. Usually go to the hundred. With probability, it's usually to the hundred. Okay. Now, this is where you also have to read because I could say, what is the probability of an odd number? Be 0.5 because there's three odd numbers on the, there's one, three, and one five and then there's two four and six so the probability of odd or even is the same so the sample space on a die would be all the way up to six you know one plus five you get it one plus five is six well seven sorry because six plus one is seven so you go up to seven and four point four oh that's two die i'm sorry two die one die would be up to six and it'd be just one roll on each. But two die is 36 because six times six is 36. And you and that is a sample space. You need to write that down too. Sample space for two die. Or two a pair of dice. I guess you say dice. Make sure you write that down because that is a test question. What is the probability of rolling a seven on a pair of dice? And all you do is just write down how many sevens you got and put that over 36. That's all you do. Real simple. Unless you want to think it up each time you're asked that. Why am I so worried about this? Because if this purple line comes unconnected, you know what happens? All this goes down and then we'll have to cancel class and then somebody will pitch and then I'll get an email from my department. Here. And then I'll say, well, I'll just teach from home. Anyway. There it is right there. That's that's an example of a probability experiment right there. It's really easier to see a sample space with two die because one die is hard to see because you only roll one number. There we go. Two, four, six. That'd be three out of six because there's six sides. There's six probabilities. So three out of six. And what they're leading up to is the formula for 
finding the probability, which will be about six out of 10 questions on your test. For the theoretical or the classic, the number of times something happens over the number of times something can happen. Write that down. Just put happen over can happen. Yep, happen over can happen. And eventually they're going to show you that. Now they're, now they're going to go the other direction and tell you that probabilities are going to be between zero and one, which means you can have a zero probability, which is unlikely, which means that there's no way. It doesn't mean, I mean, y'all know, y'all know birth control is only 99.9% .9 effective, okay? <laughs> All right, there's nothing what? Nothing perfect. So 100 is out of the question and impossible is out of the question. There's four or five words in, in probability that you did not use. One is impossible. And two is perfect. So write those two down. You're not gonna, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be perfect, guys. Some of y'all think y'all are, but you're not. Okay? There, there's gonna be somebody that says perfect. That's a, that doesn't go good. And impossible because nothing is impossible. I'm not trying to be a motivational speaker here, but you can have a zero prob probability. But does that mean that it cannot happen? You got a zero probability of getting hit by lightning. Does that mean it's not going to happen? You ever seen that commercial with, uh, oh gosh, he was on Saturday Night Live and he says, pretty sure and certain. You ever seen that commercial? You know, I, th I think we live in alternative realities because I say commercials and people are like, I've never seen that commercial. And I see it like all the freaking time. Y'all never seen that commercial where they're talking about a uh, home refinancing or something. And Tracy Morgan, Tracy, okay, forget it. Just forget it. <laughs> if it's not an animation or a Marvel comic, then y'all don't know it. So, but anyway, Tracy Morgan says, if it's certain or pretty sure, and the parents say, well, that's the same thing, isn't it? Well, are you certain you're not going to get hit by lightning or pretty sure you're not going to be hit by lightning? See, it's the same concept. You cannot go out there and say, it's impossible that I'm going to get hit by a bus. Because you can't get hit by a bus, whether you're in the parking lot or whether you're in the road out there. Okay? That's, okay, you can't use the word impossible. You can't use the word perfect. You can't use the word certain. OK, and there's another word it's in one of your tests and I can't remember the word, but it's, it's why? Because those things, what do they do? They 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 cement you in to a prediction. You see what I'm saying? They either say that something is impossible and it'll make you look like a fool or something is perfect. So you do not use those words in probability of statistics. OK, that's like, marry, OK, you marry somebody and you say she is the perfect wife. OK, now, guys, y'all think y'all are perfect. You wait till you get married because all the perfection you think you have in you is sucked out. As soon as you put that, as soon as you put that ring on, it's sucked out and it's transferred over to the woman and she thinks she is 100% perfect, OK? Just telling y'all, I'm just telling y'all as a precaution. Nobody said a word. Mr. Can you, can you back me up on this? OK, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it does. And the perfection rises and the woman is more perfect. And so, you know, when you say this is the perfect wife, one, people know you haven't been married too long. OK, and two, you don't have any kids yet. All right, so next. The sum of all the probabilities must equal what? One, not 1.01. Not 0.9999. If the, all the probabilities do not equal one, you can't have a probability distribution. And you'll get into that then. I don't know where we'll get into that, but we'll get into it later. Uh, chapter eight, probability distributions. Just write down the sum, the summation P of X, summation, P of X is equal to one. 
In other words, if you add up all your probabilities and they don't equal to one, you can mark through the whole thing and says does not exist. Can't you can't have it. If it equals 0.75, it's just like just put down the pie chart here. Is a pie chart valid if it's equal to 97%? It's not valid if it equals 102%. Probability is not valid unless it equals 1.00. Right now is when they should give us an example of a probability distribution, but I don't know if they will or not. Nope. There, there's an example right there. So you might want to write this down. Go ahead and check those numbers. Let's see. That's 36 cent. That's 60 cent. That's 73 cent. That's 87 cent and one. Did y'all just notice I said cents? Why did I say cents? Because y'all think in terms of money. And if you put these in terms of money, you can add it up a whole lot faster. If it's equal to a dollar, you're good to go. If it's not equal to a dollar, you're not good to go. This is what's called a probability distribution. Write that down. You're going to see it later. That's called a probability distribution. Remember our frequency distribution? Well, this is called a probability distribution. Each one of those has to be between zero and one. And then when you add them up, they have to equal what? One. This is a test question. And you're going to see it on the test and you're going to go, oh, well, I do that. Well, four or five of y'all will. Okay. I'm telling you right now, you have to add up all the probabilities and they have to equal one, whether they're fractions or whether they're decimals. So if I have a fraction, one fourth, one fourth, three fourths, and one fourth, is that a probability distribution? No, because that's what, five or six fourths which should be four fourths. Four fourths is equal to one. And that's the test question. I just gave you all the test question. It'll have one fourth, one fourth, three fourths, and one fourth. That's six fourths. That's not one. Four fourths is one. I just gave you all that question again. That's twice. Somebody will miss it. And this is a project we're supposed to be doing, but I'm not going to mention it because if I mention it, we'll have to do it. If an event is impossible, the probability, that is a false statement. I don't care what this slide says. That is a false statement, okay? If an event is certain, the probability, both of those are false statements. You never use those two words in probability. OK, you never use those two words. I'm going to replace those words. An event is unlo very unlikely right now, very unlikely. An event is very unlikely if you have a zero probability. And I don't know why they put this on the slide because on the test and in the homework, they have a question that says, if you get a zero, does that mean it's impossible? And the answer is no. So I don't know why they put that on there. An event is very likely, and mark out certainty, if the probability is one. Now, there are a lot of probability books and a lot of probability instructors that disagree with the books and vice versa. And this is one where I do disagree with the book because I do not use those two words whenever, if, if I was to, give a presentation in front of my department head or, you know, I would never use those two words, never. Okay. An unusual event that has a low probability of occurring. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm not going to disagree with that. It's kind of self whatever self-explanation okay here's where they get into the math that is the way you write the probability of an event now the event you can put 
heads or tails, or you can put heads in there. You can put that in parentheses. But the way that you write the probability of an event is probability parentheses, close parentheses. And we, you can put in that of parentheses whatever you want. If you're doing tails, then you can put T or you can put tails. If you're doing, if they say the probability of an event is tossing a coin and getting heads, then you could say probability of E is equal to whatever. Okay, because they've already established that E is the probability. But if you want to make sure, you just put in tails or whatever in the parentheses. It doesn't really matter what you put in there. I'm not going to sit there. I'm not going to grade your test anyway, but I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, well, you put tails in here, so I'm going to mark it wrong. No, I'm not going to do that. All right. And there it is. And you can write that down, but that means the number of times something happens over the number of times it what could happen. So how many cards are in a deck of cards? 52 is going to be your denominator for every single card question, unless it's otherwise specified. Okay. What about how many sides of a die? So there's always the denominator is always going to be six. Now, if you want to be impressed, people, you say the relative frequency is the frequency of A over the number of trials of the experiment. <laughs> how many something happens over how many something can happen? And I'm, I'm not trying to simplify it. Well, I am trying to simplify things because. Do y'all walk around saying frequency? <laughs> And there is an example, and I'm going to let you write it down. I'm not going to go through and read it. I think y'all can read, but there is an example of probability, how it should be done. The only thing that should be written out to the left is P parentheses. What are they asking you on? Probability of a teenager will file a claim. Maybe you put teen filing a claim, close parentheses, equals. And then 24 over 182. You always simplify the fractions. You've been knowing that since the third grade. You always simplify fractions if they ask you for a fraction. They can ask you for a fraction, but most of the time, unless it starts in a fraction, it'll end in a fraction. Most of the time, they want you to go to the hundred. I'm going to try to get to a stopping point here in just a minute because I know some of y'all are going to start convulsing. So I would say a 13% chance or a 0.13 probability. Now in this case, it says 132, 0.132 probability. So for every 100, 13. So for every 100, 13. <laughs> And there's another example right there of a probability distribution. This time they don't give you the relative frequency, they just give you the head count. You have to do the relative frequency. What would that be? You'd have to do what first? Add them all up and then put that number under each one. Okay. I'm trying to get to a stopping point, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. You don't have to write that down. I'm just showing you. You know, this is the head count, and just like in the previous chapter, you add them all up, divide each one of them by the total, and that's your relative frequency. In this case, it's called probability. And I think they just did that. I'm looking to see if there's anything. Classical method, same way. This is physical probability. What's the difference here? The difference is you actually do it. So if I give you, here it is, a pair of die is rolled. That's the difference. In the, in the theoretical, it will say, what is the probability of a six on a die? It ain't gonna say a pair of die is rolled. Okay, that's the difference. So compute the probability of rolling a seven. That is a question on the test, and 10 of y'all will miss that question. What is, okay, 
Say or die or die. Dice. Okay. That is a test. Okay. There is a question on the test that says, what is the probability of rolling a seven on a die? And I had a class one time, 10 of you got it wrong. Zero percent. There is no way in Hades, this is impossible, that you're going to roll a seven with one die. Because what? It's not on there. It's not on there. Okay, so that would be impossible. All right. But this is this is where you use the index card that has the 36 possibilities and you count the number of sevens and you take it over 36. If you have a probability on a card, if you have that, the, the problem's real simple. If you don't, then you're going to sit there and stare at it for 15 minutes. I know some of y'all lazy people don't want to hear that, but sorry, I'm a bastard. There he is right there. Now, you can do it one, one, two, one. Channel. You can do it. Some people do it with the dice. Some people do it with just numbers. You'll look when you Google sample space for two die, dice. When you do that, sample space for a pair of dice, you'll see some people do it like that, and you'll see some people actually just do numbers. Okay? That's your second index card that you should have for the test. Okay, I'm going to shut her down because some of y'all are going to start convulsing. I don't want to see that. And let's see how much more we got left. You should be able to start on 5.1 homework. I'll go ahead and assign it because all this is exact. Okay, that's the same thing. I told y'all to do three children. There's three children right there. And none of y'all are listening, but okay. Let me go ahead and shut her down. I'm going to call the roll and I just need y'all to speak up. So people at home, make sure you undo your mics.